Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, we are reviewing the Tudor Black Bay Chronograph. This is the reference M793500001. And uh, before I get into this review, I'll do a quick wristwatch check. And rather fittingly, I'm wearing my own Tudor, my current Tudor. This is the Submariner. I forget the reference. I bought it recently and <laughs> I just realized I'm, I'm starting to wear the same watches or the same brand of watches as when I review them. I did the same thing with the unboxing of the Amiga the other day. I wore my Amiga. I, <laughs> I don't know if that's subconscious. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Anyway, I... Um, I've still yet to review this one, really enjoying it. Yeah, it's stunning blue, uh, what more can I say? I I'll, I'll save it for, for a video, but um, yeah, anyway, that's my wristwatch check. So, the Tudor Black Bay Chronograph. Now, this particular watch caused a bit of an uproar when it was uh, initially released way back when, no, not, not way back when, it was, <laughs> it was last year, it was 2017 Basel World, and uh, it, it caused an uproar. Um, Quite a divisive watch because of its amalgamation of genres and some people have described it as a Daytona, a diving Daytona. But it's an award winner nonetheless. It actually won the Grand Prix in Horology of Geneva. It won an award for, um, I think it was the Small Complications Award. So despite the controversy it, it um, caused, it uh, still was very well received by the industry. But anyway, I guess we'll, we'll get into all of that. Now, if you're not familiar with Tudor, Tudor is a secondary brand, a little brother brand of, of Rolex, you could say. It was founded a little bit later in 1926. Um, Rolex founded first, of course, in 1919 by the same guy, the legendary Hans Wilsdorf, of course. Uh, he was a massive Anglophile, and um, he named the brand after the uh, British royal dynasty. Their symbol is the rose, the Tudor, the famous Tudor rose, of course. And uh, if you're a fan of history like me, you will definitely appreciate that. I, I certainly do. And even though, yeah, it's a Swiss brand now, it does hold a special place in my heart because of that connection. So the brand was always aimed at being a, a more affordable. Uh, alternative using a lot of the Rolex technology but most of the time with outsourced movements um, predominantly ETA and in fact actually if I just bring back my little Tudor Submariner I'll take it off for you because so you see it when I did the unboxing a lot of you asked why it had Rolex the Rolex logo on the crown and this is a good example of the brands actually sharing parts uh, this has the oyster case of course and actually, it's rather fitting I am wearing a, a Tudor Submariner today because uh, the Black Bay is a also a, a, a part of this legendary family. Now, let's just recap a brief history of the uh, Tudor divers. It's just as revered, uh, respected and sought after as by collectors as Rolex Submariners. If we rewind back to 1954 with the release of uh, the, the iconic Rolex Submariner, uh, just a little bit after the Tudor, the first Tudor Submariner was released, and um, even though they came out at the same time, they had to put out the Rolex one first because that is the primary, more important brand. Over the years, decades of of evolution, the Tudor divers really have formed a very unique, distinctive identity and um, a, a whole host of achievements. Of their own. So the first reference was the 7922 and released in 1954, unmistakably similar to its uh, the Rolex. It's not really until the second generation, a little bit, a few decades later, from 1968 to 1969, with specifically the 7016, uh, famously issued to the um, uh, French Navy, the Marine Nationale, and it was the first to include the snowflake hands, which is a trait or a, a well, if we look at the Mercedes hands, how that is synonymous with Rolex, the snowflake is almost symbolic or emblematic, shall we say, of the Tudor submariners. But not only the uh, French Navy, the, the, they were issued to um, US uh, Navy SEALs. and So the history is undeniably illustrious and, and really explains why it's just so highly regarded by collectors um, and fans, um, you know, myself included. So fast forward to 2009, Tudor had a, a bit of a renaissance. The, the brand saw a massive relaunch with a whole new plethora of product lines. Uh, 
culminating, I guess you could say, with the uh, Black Bay. The Black Bay originally came out in 2012 and it was based on ETA. And then in 2015, they introduced in-house calibers for the first time. It wasn't a reissue. It was a combination of several different references, a reinterpretation, really, of the um, early Tudor subs. Uh, Like the watch we're looking at today, very much vintage inspired. So fast forward to 2017 and here we are with a chronograph introduced to the Black Bay family. And the Black Bay family really did explode. We saw the variety and range of the line, also its popularity with with the consumer. I mean, they really have become a huge hit and helped to revitalize and rejuvenate Tudor into what has become a, a powerhouse brand that has... In my opinion, well, actually, it's an opinion shared by most people, uh, come out of the shadows of Rolex and and, and has become something respected for its own identity, its own character, its own, uh, really forging its own path, shall we say. This, quite unusually, is... (laughs) <laughs> now this is where it gets a little bit tricky and you can see why it's going to become a well it has become a bit of a marmite watch this is essentially a, a, a racing chronograph mixed with a diver so we have the addition of a um, tetrametric scale tachometer here always attributed to racing chronographs uh, not <laughs> diver and then we have the snowflake the case you know the, the key black bay elements right so Quite unusual, a brave step, certainly for Tudor. Now, Tudor's involvement with chronographs is almost equally as legendary as its divers. They started their first, I think the first chronograph was in 1970 with an oyster date. I've owned the uh, Tiger Prince that shares some of the same elements you'll see present in this watch. I'll discuss that as well. And actually it's helped me appreciate this watch uh, a little bit more. If you look at the, uh, the reference 7169, the layout, the line of symmetry running down the center, Uh, with the date at six o'clock. This is a very typical trait of the early Tudor chronograph. So it's not only paying homage, uh, an ode to vintage divers, also the chronographs of the 70s. Anyway, before we get into it too critically, let's just get the basic specifications out of the way. We have a diameter of just shy of 41.5, a height of 14.5. Lug to lug, we're looking at exactly 50 millimeters. The lug width is 22 millimeters. It hasn't really grown, I think, an, an additional couple of millimeters in height. Um, I'm not sure if that's f- the case has changed. In my opinion, the case is how I remember it. Obviously, we've got pushes and and... and you know, a different bezel. Um, So this is entirely stainless steel. We have a beautifully domed sapphire crystal. The curvature, we've got quite a dramatic step and then a subtle curve, as as you see there. The bezel is a fixed bezel with the tachometer engraved with black lacquer uh, there, beautifully done with a, a brushed satin finish. If you see these high polished beveled edges, really nice little bit of refinement there, beveling on the uh, lugs there. Just look at the sharpness of those edges. It's just sublime. Screw down pushers, the same big crown with the lacquered Tudor rose, uh, anodized copper uh, ring there for the winding crown. What's interesting, this this particular version comes on the bracelet we have. (laughs) Faux riveted bracelets and i remember when i did the unboxing the i mean i didn't actually film the unboxing because um i got this sent straight from a jeweler's uh so there wasn't any fancy packaging um so it wasn't really much of an unboxing but the first thing i did was i was pulling the links because it reminded me if you guys remember that uh, the the paul newman daytona i had a look at uh, a couple of years ago now it had the stretchy bracelet and I really thought for a split second oh this is gonna have the fortunate it doesn't these are faux rivets so if, as you can see they're not actually real the only real ones are if we see there on the um, the screwed links there on the inside of the links we have a very subtle curvature a little bit of a concave shape just to wrap around quite large spacing it is very solid I have to say uh, completely brushed with a high polish on the flanking sides there. 
um, as is the, the, the side of the case, if I neglected to mention. Beautiful mirror, high polish, something that um, Trudeau do so well. And they've obviously, well, you know, they've been taught by the masters, <laughs> uh, their brother brand. The clasp is very well done, beautifully engineered, beautifully machined. I love how they've incorporated the Tudor Shield logo. This is the the later logo that was introduced in 1950, uh, no, not 59, sorry, 1969. Uh, before that, it was predominantly the, um, the Tudor Rose there, but it's nice that they've still carried on the Rose somewhere on the watch. Um, so we have a little safety fold over, sprung a uh, little ball bearing there. I think it's ceramic and it just gives it a really nice action. Uh, and then we just flip this little lock Micro extensions there. Unfortunately, no diver extension. A little bit of a, sorry, it's not focusing. Do apologize, there we go. Um, yeah, no diver extension. A Little bit of a disappointment, but it's such an outstanding clasp. I mean, look, look, look at the action. It's just really solid. I love how they, they've put high polish on the inside of the shield. Sign Tudor, absolute class. Very nicely done. And it does actually taper, but it doesn't taper with a curve. It tapers in steps, again, mimicking the, the you know, the, the 1960s bracelets. Thankfully, they are not as tinny and, you know, the, with those uh, ghastly uh, folded links. Uh, these are absolutely solid and solid end links as well. Typical Tudor uh, screwing case back there, um, indicative really of Rolex and Tudor, uh, nothing to write home about. So if we look on the dial, we get a beautifully spaced out sub dials, applied markers, uh, we did a triangle at the 12, super luminova, big snowflake for the hour hand, very easy to distinguish, and this is obviously uh, its purpose, to tell minutes from hours. The loom is fantastic. The triangle definitely helps orientation. Uh, although we don't have markers at the uh, 9, 6 and 3, however, we do get the date. I think they, they've definitely done the rectangle shape almost to mimic the layout of the 7016. So if you remember, on, on they would have had the loom marker as a rectangle there. Very subtle, but I do like it. The seconds hand of the chronograph is very reminiscent of those uh, in my Tudor, um, what was it, the uh, the Prince Tiger. Very slender with a tiny little arrow tip. Now the whole color scheme of the watch is completely monochromatic, except for that little dash of red there with the water rating, 200 meters. So this is of course 200 meters water resistant and the uh, minute and seconds track running around the outside is actually a very slight silver. The dial itself is a matte black with a lovely grainy texture. The sub dials have splendid curvature to them. They sink down very nicely. And I think the, uh, the length of the hands is absolutely perfect, uh, especially the minute hand. And I adore the way the um, seconds hand really does reach to the outside of that track or just, just about touching it, perfect. So let's discuss the movement a little bit, and this is where it really gets interesting. Inside we have the Caliber MT5813, which is manufactured by none other than Breitling. And this comes about um, by, well, I guess you could say, a pact of steel between uh, these two companies, a trade of, of calibers, really. Tudor has been supplying Breitling with some of their in-house calibers, uh, the MT-56, which you can find in the second generation of the Pelagos and Black Bay. And in return, uh, Breitling has given Tudor its B01. This development of in-house calibers has really come about from ETA or the Swatch Group controlling or, or, or ceasing to make available ETA. So it forced some of the brands to, to um, develop their own calibers, which is not an easy thing to do. It requires a hell of a lot of investment in fact, Breitling had to uh, build an entirely new four-story building in uh, Le Champ de Fonds just for the production of the Breitling 01 movement. However, uh, the customer definitely reaps the benefit here. So the MT5813 uh, and the MT, I, I should point out, is a prefix. It sh it's short for Manufacturer Tudor. And essentially, it's a variant of Breitling's in-house movement. Tudor have modified it greatly. So several of the features that distinguish the Tudor version from the Breitling, well, 
Firstly is cosmetic. Uh, the most obvious is the sandblasted finishing on the bridges and the base plate, as well as the skeletonized or semi-skeletonized rotor that we have there. Secondly, the most significant, uh, probably uh, mechanical change is the regulator, which is actually made of a free sprung balance wheel with four adjustable masses. Uh, this is quite typical of Rolex as well. Now, even though it makes regulation a little trickier, once regulated, it's generally much more reliable. And the final change is they've got rid of the third subdial that was typically at the kind of six o'clock position in the V formation on the Breitling. I'll throw up a picture of the Breitling so you can see it, uh, what it looks like in an actual Breitling watch. So they did away with the hour uh, subdial and added a 45 minute subdial instead of the more conventional 30 minute counter at the three o'clock position. This is also, as the text on the dial implies, COSC certified. So it's a 41 joule movement. So it goes without saying that this is an automatic with a bi-directional rotor system. If I unscrew the crown, pull it out, we get quick set on the date. And if I pull it out all the way, it's hackable. You see the um, seconds for the main time there, which is on the left dial has stopped. And if we put it back into the first position, we get a manual wind. Operates at 28,800 vibrations an hour. Uh, it has an astonishing power reserve of 70 hours, which is really fantastic. But best of all, it is in fact a vertical clutch column wheel chronograph, which gives it just silky smooth operation, which we'll have a look at in just a moment. So mechanically, it really does have some serious muscle under the bonnet uh, in the engine, I guess you could say. So how does this bad boy wear? Let's pop it on the wrist and find out. Moments later. So as you can see, it is a large piece. Um, it's quite tall. The weight is a staggering 192 grams and mainly because of well the movement um the it, it's it's a big hunk of steel I, i've got to be honest however the benefit is you do get a very reassuring feeling of well it's just extremely solid feeling uh, and you can feel the quality undoubtedly it is a chunky piece. I mean, nobody can deny it. So my wrist is six and a quarter inches. I can probably get away with it, as you can see. Um, and sizing the bracelet is an absolute pleasure with, with those uh, little um, links. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit big for my tastes. But I think for most people, it, the size is a crowd pleaser. In terms of the presence and legibility, it's, it, well, as you can see, it's it's very clear, crisp, and, and easy to read. So let's take it off the wrist and summarize the watch. More moments later. Let's start with the positives first. Nobody can deny that the quality is there. Uh, the quality of the finishing, the edges, the little refinement in the details, it's all there. I mean, this is unequivocally a luxury watch. You feel it. However, I, I think they've, they've done it to a level that doesn't compromise the macho appeal at this watch. I mean, this is undoubtedly a very manly, <laughs> it evokes a feeling of machismo. It, it definitely does. I mean, what do you expect when you mix a racing chronograph with a diver? Uh, two very masculine, genres of watch, right? The styling is spot on. I, I, I like the fact that it haven't patined the loom. I kind of like the faux uh, rivets. It's, it's not going to be to everybody's taste. Uh, so you got the style of the 60s, but you haven't got the, uh, you know, the troublesome tinny nastiness of, of that era of bracelets. Uh, it's very, very secure. And actually that brings a, a good point. It's extremely solid. Performance wise, it does everything it's supposed to. In fact, actually, it's a great everyday all-in-one piece because you got 
a date, uh, you've got a great complication of chronograph. You have a diver that is usable to, to 200 meters, which is more than enough to do anything you want, or most things you want. Its monochromatic scheme is gonna make it very compatible. Definitely gonna be a strap monster. And I think the power reserve, 70 hours, is extremely long. I mean, it's, it's a great uh, Monday to Friday watch. You take it off on Friday, put it on the, um, in the watch box, pick it up on Monday, and, and it's still going, you know, which is just fantastic. But without a shadow of a doubt, its most crowning achievement or feature is the movement. Even though it's not decorated, I don't think it needs to be. It, it's in keeping with the aesthetic, the no-nonsense style of the watch. You don't want some prissy little fancy schmancy movement. It's there to serve a task and it does it impeccably well. In fact, I, let me just show you just how smooth the operation is. If I unthread the, uh, the pushes, start it again, it's instant, instantaneous, really nice action to it. I mean, this is this is what you get with a with a column wheel vertical clutch. I mean, just incredible actuation. Let's let's just let's just see. I wonder if I can put that in slow motion. I mean, no staggering, no mucking about. And when unthreaded, it's flushed beautifully with the pusher there. And ultimately what that means is incredible value. I mean, that's about as affordable as it gets for a Swiss made chronograph with a comparable movement. So for around about $5,000, it actually offers incredible value. I struggle to think of any Swiss made competitor that offers a movement like that at this level. Aesthetically, I think it's very tastefully done. It's vintage inspired without overdoing it. It's gonna age gracefully, especially the more beat up you get it. Marvelous proportions in relation to how everything complements each other. Okay, so let's talk about the negatives. Well, first of all, this combination of, of genres, uh, it caused a lot of controversy when it was first released. And for good reason. Um, it doesn't really make sense unless you're racing motorboats, what use are you gonna have for a tetrametric scale in a dive watch? It, it doesn't really make sense there. One could argue, well, how many of us actually go diving? How many of us actually go whizzing around a, a racetrack like Steve McQueen? Not many. However, we do appreciate fine design. There is a lot of fine design going on here, but this might be a, a mixing of genres a bit too much for most people, and I can certainly understand why. What is this exactly? I mean, some people have described it as a Daytona, a diving Daytona, perhaps an identity crisis. But on the reverse side of that thinking, one could argue that, in fact, it kills two birds with one stone. Now, I believe this is not the first time Tudor have actually done a diving chronograph. There was that hydronaut, but it did have the dive timing bezel. It didn't have the snowflake hands. And as you can see, as I'm talking the, about the negatives, perfect timing, had the subdial been recording uh, minutes, let's say around 35, 30 minutes, you wouldn't be able to read that. Now, this only affects you if you are between the hours of what is that, two to four o'clock? I mean, so it's not the end of the world. However, we, we've got to mention it. I mean, some of the functionality is lost there. Also, the crown, this crown was designed for their diving watches. This crown wasn't designed for a chronograph. And I'll tell you why, even, I mean, the problem is exaggerated because I have gloves on, but when you're adjusting the time, sometimes you knock your thumb uh, and I'm, I'm talking without the gloves even, uh, it, it's a little tricky to grip, very minor annoyance, but you can kind of see that the, the style has been forced together. It doesn't, doesn't quite harmoniously, you know, really blend. And these little traits, these little, like the hands, like the crown, are indications of that. And we should not neglect to mention the lack of diver extension. Maybe I'm asking too much, I, I don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong, the clasp and bracelet is exquisitely well done. I mean, it really is a, a, a beautifully engineered and, and produced piece. The only last negative is I feel it's a little bit too chunky and clumsy for 
formal attire. You're you're going to be. Uh, look, don't get me wrong. You can you can wear it with whatever the hell you want. It has quite a statuesque profile. Too tall to slide under a cuff, and I think aesthetically it. it lends itself more to the Steve McQueen in Bullet rather than Steve McQueen in Thomas Crown Affair where he's all, you know, a suited and booted Savile Row fitted suit. Definitely, definitely not. <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, it's incredible value for money uh, with a rather daring break from the norm uh, that I think typifies Tudor as the rebellious younger brother, a brand that is a little bit more daring um, and I think this watch reflects that spirit perfectly. Not for the smaller wristed and not for the formal attire. For me personally, it hasn't really captured my heart. I'm impressed by the quality and the value, but uh, if I had to go with a Tudor chronograph, I'd probably go with my Prince, the Tiger Prince again, uh, or the Heritage. It's just strictly a, a racing watch. But at the end of the day, the good certainly outweighs the bad uh, by a long shot. Okay, guys, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, before I go, a quick thank you to my good friends at Timeless Luxury for so graciously lending this watch in and making this review possible. They are an authorized dealer for Tudor and a whole host of other fantastic brands. One of the most, well, actually, if not the most professional watch dealers in the country, hugely respected, um, highly reputable. I highly recommend them. Shout out to my good friend Stephen and Dan Broadfoot there. So I'm going to leave it there. Please let me know your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it down below. Dying to hear what your feedback on this particular piece. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.